Mini episode 529 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.info. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. 30 seconds. In front of all these people, you're going to pull out a gun and you're going to shoot an unarmed man. 20 seconds. So what are you going to do? 10. Welcome to the FDH Lounge and the Justified Episode Recap. It was justified. With your original dignitaries. Verno! Rick Morris and Jason Jones. You got ice cold water running through your veins. Breaking down each Justified episode. The moment they've concluded. Did you take a peek inside the soul of Raymond and you? I'm just gonna let that old dog lie. Real time reactions. Next level analysis. You seem to be harboring a bit of hostility there, brother. So I've been told. And now, your dignitaries. Well, I believe we can take her from here. Welcome, everyone, to mini episode 529 of the FDH Lounge. This is your justified episode 6. Point seven recap. Uh, it is I, Rick Morris, from the FDH Lounge, also from the FDH Lounge, Senior Editor Jason Jones, coming on with me momentarily. Additionally, in doing these shows, we are also representing the website, not just another TV site.com, where Jason is the underboss over there, and I am a columnist for Justified. Of course, you can check out the reviews every week, which are packaged together with these shows. Also, the reviewer for Better Call Saul. And uh, in the next couple of days, I will be putting together a spoiler and non-spoiler recap for Season 3 of House of Cards, which I have made my way through relatively briskly. So you can look forward to that. All that great coverage. Jason, of course, covers a number of shows over at NotJustAnotherTVSite.com. Jason, uh, of course, uh, someone who uh, is so well-attuned to my thoughts on TV approach, philosophies, et cetera, that uh, he and I actually, uh, as has been noted previously, uh, our favorite TV comedians work together quite frequently, our partners on a number of things. And as I once said last year in bringing him in for a show, he is the George St. Geekland to Mike Elfizan, FDH senior editor Jason Jones. How are you doing tonight, my man? <laughs> uh, pretty good juggling a uh, toddler birthday party and trying to get my justified on at the same time, but not bad. You are a, a great multitasker in that regard. Of course, uh, happy birthday to a uh, little Mac. And uh, this, uh, this episode uh, tonight uh, filled with uh, thoughts of uh, domesticity, uh, kind of tying that uh, right back in with uh, Raylan getting the first view of his uh, daughter in person during this season and probably only one of the only times since she's been alive, quite frankly. So a coincidence that comes on this day for you, but uh, a number of interesting uh, plots going tonight. I don't even know where, uh, where, where do you want to get started with this? Well, I wanted so badly to just start off by yelling into uh, the microphone here, uh, how I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I called this from the beginning. Um, and then I saw Boyd switch clips. And now I'm very, very scared for Ava, uh, for what that means. Um, so I, I don't mean to start at the end and work our way back, but, I, you, you know, we've talked about before how you seek out information and I try to repel the information. Um, and it, maybe you know something I don't, but that entire situation with Ava and Boyd and, and the tone and then the reveal – and then him uh, switching clips, that whole, say, 15 minutes unabridged, uh, it really had me worried for her safety. Um, but, and, and, yeah, I want to get to the, um, oh, uh, Winona and Raylan bit uh, in a moment. But for me, we've talked early in this season about how exactly is Ava going to be the C.I., and with and Boyd and, and how does that all work out? Uh, and just to refresh everyone's memory, my theory was that she'll do what she's got to do for Raylan, but at some point that it would come out 
and then they would devise some way to keep Braylon in the dark while they made moves to secure their own uh, financial security moving forward. Um, I hope that's still the case, but no one switches clips without uh, shooting a single round unless one of those clips is holding blanks. The question is, which one was it? That's a very good question. Uh, And and Boyd had a very pensive look on his face. I I guess I could say that because that kind of covers a wide range of of ground. I I don't know at this late hour if I can best describe the look on the face of Boyd Crowder at that point in time. He had been gaslighting Ava all throughout the episode. Basically, it doesn't take long to kind of sum up that particular thread of the episode. Um, He intimidates her into going up to the cabin. And she, meanwhile, for whatever reason, seems to be getting a a, uh, Bowman Crowder vibe from him as far as how Bowman used to treat her once they got married. And she was kind of attributing this to, okay, this is how Crowder men act when they're about to get married for Boyd, it was all very, very specific. He had the information that he was going on. He, at one point in time, name drops. This was close to when they had their final resolution. Name drops Johnny and Devil, who both had in common uh, being snitches on him, uh, and either to the authorities, but both to other uh, criminal entities. And uh, it, it was just an interesting kind of a thing here that, that uh, he, he just was – he knew he was messing with her head the whole time here. And my only sense here to, to answer your question as to what was making me say that, because you had even texted me at one point, I think this might be it. And I was like, no, I don't think so. It's just because, and I think you'll back me up when I say this. I, I, I'm guessing that's the case anyways. Throughout the course of five and a half seasons now of watching the show, and we reached the halfway point of the final episode about ha- or about, of the final season about halfway through this episode, that would have been too on the nose. They don't they don't do things that way, Jason. That's that's my guess. You know, the, the previews for this week setting it up. Oh, Ava's afraid of getting shot on the hunt. Oh, did you really think she was then going to get shot on the hunt? That's not how they operate. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right, and that's that's the benefit of of stepping back and and watching it from an analytical perspective, I guess. Uh, and with the chaos going on here and and watching it, um, everything said it's way too soon, way yep. too soon. Let's just assume for a second that it's in the cards that Ava has to die for whatever reason, and I, I don't want to speculate on if that will happen or why that would happen. But if that happens, you're absolutely right. This is a episode 10, episode 11 type of a situation, if that's how it plays out, or even series finale. But, yeah, when you have a moment to remove the emotional involvement from it uh, and to stop watching it like a fanboy, yeah, it, it wouldn't have made much sense there. Uh, and, and I sent a follow-up when the, the the switching of the clip happened, and I realized how much time was left in the episode, um, I, I don't know that he'll be able to do anything, especially if she does come clean. I, I, you know, I think if he's going to get firewood and he comes back and she just lays it all out in just one detail after the other, then maybe we have our Bonnie and Clyde situation restored. Uh, but, no, you're absolutely right. It, it would not have fit. It would have been representative of of these showrunners to have pulled the trigger, pun intended, uh, at this point. You're absolutely right about that. Well, the other thing, too, is that for, for somebody like Ava, and I can't I, I can't exactly put my, my, my finger on it when I'm say, saying timing, I guess, as, timing, judgment, whatever. Any of these types of things have really never seemed to be her strong suit. She's not somebody possessed of a level of shrewdness and cunning, the level of uh, Boyd Crowder or a lot of the people around her. She's street smart in her own way. But, you know, she when you're talking about Boyd Crowder, you're talking about, you know, next level thinking and analysis, and she's clearly not on that level. She's not well suited to be the person in the middle trying to balance all the sides against one another. And I think we saw that again tonight because I had said earlier in the season, Maybe she at one point would come clean to Boyd and 
try to work out a way for them to turn this back around on Raylan and get him caught up in the whole thing, get him chasing his tail. But I always thought that would be contingent on her hatching the plan. And, again, knowing that this, this kind of thing isn't her strong suit, I don't know why I ever thought that. I, I, I clearly was wrong. She now has been dragged into confessing the truth. So I got to yeah. think at this point, I think you could see it from that pensive or whatever you want to call it, look on Boyd's face at the end. How does he ever trust her completely? I mean, I, I give her credit that if she was going to go down, if she was going to get shot right then and there, she was going to do so fighting. She threw the things back in Boyd's face that I do think registered with him a little bit as far as why she felt abandoned and why, in her mind, it wasn't the 100% betrayal that he felt that it was. But nevertheless, even with that, even with her having a sense of, of being at least a tiny bit justified in doing what she had to do to get out of jail, the fact that he had to drag this out of her how do they work cohesively from this point on? I, I think she probably missed her window for working the Bonnie and Clyde angle. I, I do think as we left last week and we come into this week, uh, I did come into it with that saying, she's missed the window. There, there was plenty of opportunities for her to pull him aside and say, listen, I'm going to tell you something that is going to rock you to the core, but you need to hear what I have to say so that you can understand the why and what happens next. And if he would have done that and sort of said, hey, listen, I felt betrayed. I felt put into a corner. I thought there was no way I'd be able to fight for my life every single day in prison while you were out wheeling and dealing uh, and forgot about me. And sort of she, would, she, would have, she had to throw that in his face at some point um, because ultimately someone like Boyd should, when, when the dust settles, respect the idea of self-preservation beyond all, all else. So uh, there's that. But then had she set it up properly and got him in the right mood the right time, and she had opportunity, I really do think that he would have been very receptive to it. and It would have been, okay, like, here's what's next, and here's how we do this, and that's what's going forward. There wouldn't have been the betrayal if it was done within a certain window of time. The one saving grace, though, is that when she threw it in his face, maybe he got it, maybe he was still filled with emotion or anger or whatever. But the question is, I think it comes back to the running, the going to Limehouse, because if he really sits back and thinks about it, the only way for her to save her own skin and to ensure that she doesn't burn void is to run for her life. There's no way that she sticks with the marshal's office and keeps feeding them information uh, to some end that doesn't include taking down Boyd. So maybe by this time next week, uh, hopefully, Boyd is able to see things from all different angles and realize that everything that she's done to this point was either self-preservation or moves to ensure her safety plus not burning boy. Now, whether he sees that or not, it's a whole different discussion. But um, I do agree that she missed the window. But I do think there is some area with six episodes to go that allows us to see Ava in an element that maybe she's forced to prove to Boyd by doing something, maybe. Uh, but at the end of the day, I, I think there's still some wiggle room to make it work. Uh, whether they do that or not, we, we shall see. Well, there's going to be, you know, there's going to be at least one big loyalty test coming from Boyd at this point. But oh, uh, in terms of, oh, yeah, yeah, there, there's going to be. And, and who knows if that will even suffice because you, you talked about that. And I, I want to harken back to the one point here about her running and that it would have meant self-preservation and also preservation of Boyd in terms of him not going to jail. What it also likely would have meant was that one way or another, she was never going to see him ever again, that she was going to disappear uh, in a trace, and that was going to be that, which is really, that's another form of betrayal to Boyd, uh, given that he intends to get married to her. And I look at it this way, that for, for somebody like Boyd, who, you know, he had his his issue that he went through in season one where he found religion and ultimately that proved to be a dispiriting thing for him when his father murdered all of his followers and 
he kind of wandered through the wilderness, and ultimately he latched on to Ava. And it's one of these things where I just look at it that he he puts her on on this pedestal, and it's a thing. And and I could I could make a big sociological commentary about how guys oftentimes do this with women. Uh, you know, I, I won't make it a macro issue here. I'll, I'll just stay on the micro that he certainly has done it in this instance. And he has looked at her as though she's perfect, uh, which is unrealistic, as, as we all know. Uh, to, to put somebody on a pedestal to that level, I, I think it sort of inhibits you from, no, no, sort of actually does, it inhibits you from seeing them as a real person, warts and all. And I just sort of wonder at this point that, that's been ripped away from Boyd, and that's been sort of central to his identity since mid to late season two. So yeah. what kind of a deal are we looking at here? Now, granted, they had their breakup when she was in prison last year, but I, I think he felt like they broke up because they had to, circumstance, fate, et cetera. This, this is a betrayal that, that she willingly brought on uh, him and, and, and on them, on, on what they have together. And the way that Boyd looked at this, how, how do you think that's going to affect the dynamic? Because, uh, I, again, if, if his view of her was almost unrealistic to this point in time, and then she goes and does something like this because he's condoned anything she's ever done, whether it's killing uh, the pimp or anything else like that, uh, even when he hasn't really been on board, he's condoned everything she's ever done. I, I, just, I just wonder how you expect him, how any of us expect him to look at this rationally at this point and reason through it, given where he's coming from. No, it's a great, it's a great point uh, to further this debate. Um, and I think the short answer, if there is an answer, is that test you mentioned. Even if Boyd welcomes her back to her face and says, listen, no harm, no foul, uh, nothing serious happened. They don't have anything. We didn't lose any ground. But now, uh, granted, I made you tell me, but once that came out, we now have somewhere we can go with this. There, there's a way, an angle to play it. And, yeah, I think there's going to be something significant that she's going to have to do to prove her loyalty along with her behavior. Now, if she comes in next week and she no longer works at the salon and there's absolutely no sketchy behavior at all. She's not talking about curling up on the couch and watching TV, which is something we never have heard at this point. Um, <laughs> we just see her, you know, as, you know, the his right hand, so to speak, and she's willing to do whatever he asks with no hesitation, then maybe we start to see um, something grow a little bit. Now, now the – more important answer is knowing that this whole series is going to end in six episodes, we never may have an answer to that. We may get to a point where they have a working relationship and maybe they still feel this for each other, but we're not going to see Boyd Crowder ever, I think, get to a point where there is true and unconditional trust in Ava, but that all depends on how this ends too. Um, if they walk off into the sunset, we've got to just assume that, that they're good there. Um, if Boyd or Ava or someone else of consequence is, is caught in the crossfires and dies, well, we're never going to find out anyway. But the important thing up front is how does this go forward? And my thing, even though it makes no sense, is I need to get to the bottom of is he going to kill her? Because if he kills her next week, which wouldn't fit, as we've already discussed, then it's a moot point anyway. But at some point, i, I got to believe they're going to work towards a place where he can trust her enough to get done whatever it is, say, episode 12 or 13. Um, either he kills her right away, or there's going to be a matriculation where we're watching them grow back together again. Um the details, though, I, I don't have answers for. That's an excellent, excellent point. Uh, I'm thinking maybe what we should do is pick off a couple of the other minor plot points here and sure. route the circling back around to Raylan and, and uh, Winona. Uh, it, it, one of the things here we're talking about with uh, Ava and Boyd, 
if they can work out successfully a way to uh, spring along Raylan. This is something I had picked up on earlier in the episode. When, when Raylan was uh, out there uh, with the baby, brought her into the office, the, the very standoffish demeanor, I would say, that Rachel was giving him uh, at the office, uh, there, I really even like borderline unfriendly as far as not having an interest in coming over and saying hi to the kid, anything like that. Uh, she's already souring on his approach to all of this. So is, is something like her behavior tonight supposed to foreshadow some of the problems that are going to be coming once Ava and Boyd uh, start trying to get him chasing his tail? Probably. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> I, I that think, was a leading question, that, Counselor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, um, I, I think that she's kind of – it's kind of been wearing thin for a while now. So uh, in the back of my mind, even though it wasn't a primary issue, I've always had this idea that at some point um, is Raylan going to just keep being Raylan and, and push come to shove? Is something going to happen? Is the case going to be taken from him? Is is his focus um, too Raylan-y <laughs> for the office to handle? I, I don't know what all is going to happen, but you get the sense for probably two or three episodes now, even when you go back to uh, when they caught the kid trying to steal from his dad, you kind of got the impression that the whole act is wearing thin. So if if Rachel's the one in charge and Art is just sort of there, as as we saw him today, uh, it, we may get a, a when push comes to shove situation. Uh, or we sit back and we just let this one job get done, and then we deal with it later. But there absolutely there, there seems to be some sort of contention, um, metaphorical game of chicken or whatever, and somebody's going to lose. So who that is again? Devil's in the detail. Uh, my my money is not on the subordinate uh, in this situation. Uh, sure. Even if you could say. He was a, he was made a star because of the resolution of the Drew Thompson case. Of course, we remember that that was followed up by the uh, I believe it was a six figure settlement with Dewey Crow shortly thereafter, which uh, acted to kind of uh, tarnish uh, the, uh, the 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 glory that had just come his way. Speaking of that whole sequence in the office, there Avery had been brought in for questioning, and uh, he had a uh, episode with uh, earlier. Uh, with Seabass, uh, where he seemed to be looking to put Seabass in charge of the whole operation now with Walker out in the field. Uh, and uh, it, it'll be interesting to see how the second banana can step up there. But uh, a fascinating dynamic of uh, Avery and Art kind of sparring back and forth, some great banter between them. And uh, Art uh, clearly looking to drive a wedge between uh, Avery and Catherine. Something tells me. There's all, all the mistrust on both sides in that relationship that's already uh, necessary, but uh, Art seemed to be giving it his uh, best as far as uh, adding to that. You know, my immediate question to that is, is, do you think that's it? Is it just the driving the wedge thing? Or is, is my first reaction was wondering if uh, Art is trying to catch Avery slip on some detail that allows him to put Avery down for something previous. Because uh, there was that whole thing about um, her her husband at the time who died in prison, they say, allegedly. Um, and it seems like maybe Avery had, had, had been playing this chess game for a great many years. So I really didn't know exactly what to make of that. And if the, if the answer is it's just to create some tension with Avery and Gavin, then, then by all means, go for it. But my bigger moment of curiosity is, aside from the fact that he's physically able to do so, why is Art at the office? Why is Art walking in to uh, talk to a guy that's arguably the most important detail to the case at hand, if not most important detail to the show at this point, whose name is not Boyd or Raylan? That's a great question. And uh, it's, that would definitely give Avery one more thing to be uh, worried about. Uh, he, he already seems to have written off. He's trying to clear his plate where he can. He seems to have written off Walker, 
who uh, had an encounter with some uh, frat boys earlier in the episode that looked like it was going to go south. He then enlisted them as part of his misdirection uh, as, uh, again, they were uh, giving they, they, a, a footprint of, of what appeared to be his whereabouts with a credit card uh, through a decent part of the Mid-South uh, until uh, Tim and Raylan kind of sussed out that that wasn't him. So Walker, unfortunately, then did uh, kill some uh, EMTs at the end there. Uh, they going to try and make a getaway, I suppose, in the ambulance and so you, you, you saw that part going on with him. There's really not uh, – is, is there anything really more that needs to be talked about with that? Because that, that, that all seemed to be pretty straightforward. Yeah. Uh, some, of, some of the things that we saw today, you take it face value. Yeah, I, I think that one is. The last thing I want to ask you about before we get into uh, Raylan and Winona is uh, the thing with uh, good old uh, Zach Randolph down in the mines there at the uh, the beginning. The uh, <laughs> working that dangerous post game. Uh, of course, uh-huh. he, uh, he sent the one guy to his death last week, and looked like he was about to send another guy to his death. But uh, all he did at that point was stop him from going after him. Uh, it just kind of left us with that big tease, and it never cut back to them the rest of the episode. Any better idea of what is on his mind and what he might be up to? Well, there was one little tidbit of information that they gave um, that, that at least made me pause for a minute, and that was uh, good old Zach Randolph there mentioning that the fall sounded like it was a good 300 to 400 feet, which is fine, and, and maybe on the surface doesn't mean a whole lot, but it tells me that that, again, he's familiar with this particular spot. Uh, If he's right about that, maybe he just says it as a deterrent uh, for the other guy going down to to see if he was okay, because that was the whole thing is maybe he's still alive. We should find out. Um, But the bigger issue here right now is, number one, what's down that mine shaft that didn't used to be a human being, unless that's the answer previous to, last week's episode. Um, is it something of value? Is it something Boyd can't know about? Or is this some grander plan to hurt Boyd for the sheer fact that he is a Crowder and Bowman was a Crowder and coming back to some sort of family revenge? Beyond those things, I have no clue as to what Zachary's doing right now because it seems like he's trying to play both sides and we have no idea um, to bring this together what the trophy or prize is at the end of the finish line. So I have no idea what's happening. I don't know what's going on. All I know is there's something there that it hasn't been quite explained yet and probably will play into some significant moment. Maybe not season finale significant, but significant somewhere between, say, episode uh, 9 and 12. The, the, the Bowman Crowder angle for, from from Uncle Zach has always seemed contrived to me, and and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sit here and minimize uh, domestic violence, but yeah. Bowman Crowder was killed by Ava, so it seems to me I don't know what the exact scoreboard looks like, but probably something like Randolph Family Two. Crowder's one, you know I don't know why he would be after revenge. Yeah, the guy beat her. And then she killed him. And I don't have a problem with her killing him uh, for having done that. But, uh, you know, in any kind of, uh, you know, I- I'm familiar with these uh, southern blood feuds, Jason. And the, the way the pendulum swings back and forth, usually it's the family that suffered a death that's coming after the other one. So that would seem to be the Crowders. It would be their turn to come after the Randolphs instead of the other way around. This thing's just giving me a headache, I guess, thinking about it too much. But, uh We'll have to see well, where that uh, goes. You bring up an interesting point, whether you meant to or not, and this is almost becoming a pet peeve of mine when we talk about uh, television, and specifically high-quality television. When I was young, um, I remember the first time I heard a news story about something like this was, the way they explained it, we're talking like 1986 or so, was one guy stepped, let's say person one stepped on person two's shoes. Person two stabs person one, 
person one gets his boys and they come with guns, then person two comes back with bigger guns. Uh, and that's just a basic idea. Now, you see it with any sort of gang or uh, outlaw element, and then you even see it, ironically, with police officers in television. I don't want to cast any negative light on actual police officers because I wouldn't do that. But in television especially, and I'll, I'll use the actually the movie The Dark Knight uh, just because it's the one that sticks out to me the most, is in that movie you've got all kinds of carnage happening and then some cop stands up and says, no more dead cops. And and my perspective as just an onlooker, having no horse in the fight, so to speak, is to say, well, I understand cops have a serious job to do, but there are other people dying as well. Those people should not be dying either. Um, so with this whole situation, trying to narrow down if this is a revenge issue, you're absolutely right. Ava got the better end of the deal because she's alive. And if anything, if you are keeping score, it, it may seem <clears throat> crude and rudimentary, but at the end of the day, absolutely. It's, it's Randolph's two, Crowder's one, if you want to look at it that way. So there really shouldn't be a revenge issue. There shouldn't be. And I hate the idea that somebody says that you've done this thing to me, so I'm going to do worse to you just because. Well, you know, in, in any other circle of life, that doesn't work. That's just not how things are done. So if there is a revenge element, it's absolutely founded in bias and all kinds of twisted logic. So Yeah, it, so it, it's either going to be bad writing or it's going to be part of uh, Zach Randolph's bigger agenda and part of a smokescreen. I'm betting on the latter. I'm betting on a good explanation in terms of, the writing. Last thing to get to here with Raylan and Winona. Uh, again, they sort of did their dance the same way as Ava and Boyd uh, circling one another through the course of the episode. With them, it was a thing of, of what their future was going to be as they kind of got a taste of, of what uh, newlywed life uh, with the kid would be if they got together. And in the end, kind of surprisingly, Winona who's always sort of been, I, 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 I don't want to play into the trope of the killjoy uh, woman or whatever, but she's always been the one trying to pull him away from the life. At the end, it's more or less an unconditional surrender. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take you on whatever terms you want. You don't have to walk away from this. It seems to be teasing to me, Jason, what they might call in the wrestling business a false finish. Uh, a sense that we may wrap up this series without the kind of resolution uh, in terms of Raylan's character that we have figured all along was coming. I think there will be yeah. big changes between now and then, but this was a tease tonight of ending the series on kind of a status quo note. I certainly don't expect that. Yeah, there was a little bit of a curveball there because going back throughout the series, you've been, and I don't want to put you in a corner, but you've been a little bit of a Winona person. I've been kind of an Ava person. And yes. this was the first yes. time where I really appreciated uh, this moment from from Winona, and it it caught me off guard. I don't have any sort of end game ideas, but uh, I really did enjoy that moment of her coming to grips with the fact that if she wants Raylan, and Raylan will probably make a good father, then she's got to come off her high horse just a little bit. So, does this mean that it's softened up Raylan enough that he's willing to just walk away? from everything and say, I don't need closure on Boyd Crowder? That I don't know. But it clearly was a big moment. It definitely was. There's no question about that. What it means, where it's going for right now, her and the baby are going back to Florida. And, uh, again, the, the fact that, uh, you know, he, he was clearly uh, shaken up uh, by the whole uh, notion of uh, the baby having a heart murmur and there being some potential issues there. And, uh, again, you, you can see how attached uh, he was to her when he was uh, taking her around there at the office. And, again, kind of jarringly, everyone but uh, Rachel kind of coming over and uh, being charmed by the baby. So that was a kind of an interesting uh, subplot, the way that it went. It took Raylan out of the action for the night. He's going to be back in the action next week. Six episodes to go. Very clear at this point, uh, Jason. We wondered about the notion of the structure of the season. Was there going to be any kind of a mid car or mid mid season uh, finale? Then the reset push to the end, especially with the compressed time frame, because these last couple episodes have taken place only over a couple of days. 
this is this is moving in an inexorable line towards the end. It's clear about that, I think, as as we move towards the end here. The last six episodes, they're going to keep building to whatever the final climax is going to be. I don't think there's going to be much resolution next week, the week after, whatever. Mm -hmm. Whatever there is, I think, will be in tiny pieces. Yeah, and, and you know what? It, it fits. The slow build to the end, and hopefully we get to some great climax. Um whether that means somebody walks off in the sunset or not, I don't know. But it's going to be Reservoir Dogs. It's going to be Breaking Bad. It's going to be something major, uh, and the fallout of which should define these characters. That you know, in the end. So I can't wait. But yeah, I don't think anything major, major happens next week. Yeah, I think that's the kind of build that we're on. Uh, if we're lucky, one of these next couple of episodes will be like six point three, which I know you said was uh, very possibly the the, the greatest. Uh, one that they've done that was not one of the mega episodes, but as far as building yeah. and place setting, whatever, I sure wouldn't mind another one like that in the mix, but I have no complaints about how they're going with this, setting it up. Uh, another great talk with you, Jason, after the show here tonight. Thank you so much, my man, uh, breaking it down with you for 6.7. We'll be on 6.8 next week. Thank you all, everyone, for joining us. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, All Clear Channel Affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IAmBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Out. Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Papermate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, the Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse and the Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements. 